All right, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Manager with the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Museum and Education Department at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Barb, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Barb Oschleger-Garvey. I am SF Wednesday, the... Um, former director of the Museum and Education Department, the Forest Preserve District. Um, I am retiring. So this is my last uh, rodeo, but uh, a great run. Last last program here, last Lincoln, Lincoln program as part of our 15th annual Lincoln Lecture Series. Thank you so much, Barb, for, for being here today and for putting on uh, this series of programs for the last 15 years, as well as all the other uh, dozens, hundreds of programs as well in the past and exhibits and uh, a pleasure to to work alongside you over the past five and a half years. Um, uh, but um, today we are here for um, a special program titled Lincoln and Medicine. Um, and in just a few short moments, um, we will bring on uh, our speaker today, um, uh, Glenna schroeder Len Line. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. My apologies, Glenna. Um, uh, but uh, before we get into today's program, um, I did just want to go over a few housekeeping items as well as promote um, some upcoming programs as well. Um, first and foremost, let us know where you're watching from this afternoon. Um, uh, always like to see where folks are tuning in from. So jot that down in the comments section below, whether you're watching uh, here in Champaign County where we're streaming from. Um, or uh, other parts of Illinois, other parts of the country, or elsewhere, let us know where you're watching from this afternoon by putting that down in the comments section below. Um, if you don't know anything about the Museum of the Grand Prairie, um, uh, we opened originally um, in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Uh, the museum is part of the uh, Museum Education Department, at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, a collection of seven forest preserves, uh, two educational facilities, including the museum, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, Homer Lake Forest Preserve, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, um, and a whole bunch more here in Champaign County. Um, uh, in fulfillment of our district's mission to protect Champaign County's natural and cultural resources um, and inspire people to care for, enjoy, and explore their natural world, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District recognizes its responsibility to acknowledge those Native peoples who came before us on this land. Uh, we currently work to preserve and tell the story of the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi Nations. Uh, Native Americans shape the landscape that the Forest Preserve District sits within, and we must recognize that the Forest Preserves occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the peoples previously mentioned. Uh, they were the first stewards of the land, and it's necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations, to work with them, and to continue to steward the land and educate the public with honor and respect. Uh, CCFPD will work to be inclusive of all differences and keep Native peoples and their history at the core of our efforts. Um, uh, today's program is uh, a part of the 15th annual Lincoln Lecture Series, as I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, this has been an ongoing effort uh, to, to discuss many issues and themes associated with the life and times of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, tied to uh, an exhibit at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, Champaign County's Lincoln, uh, uh, which if you haven't seen it, you should get out to the museum when we reopen on March 1st to check out this awesome exhibit, um, uh, highlighting many stories um, from uh, Champaign County's history that involve Abraham Lincoln um, and a whole bunch more inside that awesome hands-on exhibit space. Um, in addition to being part of the 15th Annual Lincoln Lecture Series, this program is one of many programs uh, tied to a special exhibit. We opened last May um, in 2022. Uh, the exhibit's titled A History of Healing, Infectious Diseases, and Community Responses to Defeat Them. Um, the exhibit focuses on the local and worldwide impact of such diseases as the 1918 flu, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, polio, typhoid, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. Um, in addition to examining the impact diseases had on our health and well-being, the exhibit highlights particular instances in the past 
as well as the present, where local citizens came together during previous epidemics and pandemics for the betterment of their communities. And again, once we reopen, we encourage you all, if you're local, uh, to come out and visit this special exhibit at our museum. Uh, we will reopen for spring hours, open every day of the week from 1 to 5 p.m. on March 1st. Um, also, just wanted to promote a few other programs coming up uh, at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District on Saturday, February 25th at Homer Lake Interpretive Center. If you're local um, over at Homer Lake Forest Preserve in Homer, Illinois, uh, we encourage you to register for our annual Maple Sugar Days program where we will explore the science and history behind maple sugaring, uh, visit Homer Lake Forest Preserve's historic sugar maple grove, and learn how to make maple syrup ourselves. Um, uh, the program does require registration, and we encourage you uh, to register by visiting ccfpd.org. Um, and then on Thursday, March 16th at 7 o'clock, uh, we will kick off our annual Garden Speaker Series with a special virtual program on our Facebook and YouTube pages, much like today's program, uh, where Megan Romberg, a mycologist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, will present the program titled One of the Fungal Final Frontiers filling in the gaps on our knowledge of North American microfungi and how you can help. Again, this program is virtual on our Facebook and YouTube pages on Thursday, March 16th at 7 o'clock Central Time. Uh, for updates and more info on all programs, uh, as well as what's happening throughout the museum and County Forest Preserve District, we encourage you to find us on social media, as well as visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Should you have any questions tonight, uh, I'm sorry, this afternoon, uh, put those in the comment section. You have a comment, you know, jot that down there. We always like to have as interactive of a program as possible with these virtual programs. So please uh, join us by uh, chiming in in the comment section um, this afternoon. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Barb, where she will introduce our special guest today. Thanks, Pat. So I get to introduce Glenna. Are we going to show Glenna? <laughs> um, because it's my last time to introduce anybody. <laughs> and I'm really, really pleased that to have Glenna today because uh, she's a, a, the, a, the expert on Lincoln and medicine, uh, having written a book by that very name. Go look it up it's, uh, uh, or even purchase it. <laughs> it um, it's an excellent book. Um, uh, Glenna started out her, her career in museum, apparently, Southwest Museum as an archivist and uh, librarian mm -hmm. and uh, has taught at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, Washington College in Maryland, Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, uh, Tennessee. Is that correct? Um, her books include the Encyclopedia of Civil War Medicine, Confederate Hospitals on the Move, mm -hmm. Andrew Johnson, a biographical companion, where and she worked as an assistant editor at the papers of Andrew Johnson, um, and edited a book, uh, Treasures of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, and of course, pertinent to today, the Lincoln and Medicine book. Um, she was most recently the uh, assistant editor of papers of Abraham Lincoln and the and was the manuscripts librarian at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and at Springfield and does some freelance work still, which nice to hear that that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but uh, as I have always said, you didn't come here to hear me or Pat talk. You came here to hear Glenna's talk. So without any further ado, Thank you so much, Glenna, for appearing for us today. And the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to have been invited to speak about Lincoln and medicine during your Lincoln lectures. And I promise that I am not going to make this a commercial for my book. However, <laughs> if you are interested in it, um, my publisher, uh, Southern Illinois University Press, and I would be thrilled if you wanted to buy a copy at some point. <laughs> But the point is, really for bringing this up, is that I'm going to be um, talking today about a lot of the things that I discovered while I was doing research for the book. One of the interesting things um, about people discovering that they have some kind of a, a, a problematic illness 
is that it, it tends to make you feel kind of alone and frightened. And when my sister, uh, my younger sister, was diagnosed with a, a congenital heart arrhythmia when she was uh, in seventh or eighth grade, sometime in the late 1960s. And one of the first things the doctor did when he told the family about this was to, um, to say that, that Winston Churchill had this uh, kind of arrhythmia. And the idea is to make the patient feel better by helping them understand that um, that they're not alone and that some famous people have had very productive lives, even if they have this particular disability or um, it, medical issue. Now, this seems to be even more the case when the patient can be compared to Abraham Lincoln. And as I did research, I discovered all the different kinds of things that Lincoln might possibly have had. Um, and I list them alphabetically. Aortic regurgitation, ataxia, attention deficit disorder, cancer, cardiac insufficiency, congestive heart failure, crossed eyes, depression, epilepsy, homosexuality, hypogonadism, Marfan syndrome, MEN2B, which is an abbreviation for multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B, mercury poisoning, syphilis, thyroid problems, and tuberculosis. And more recently than this list, some people have also suggested a skin disease called Favre-Ricoche syndrome. Uh, French is not my language, so it's something along those lines for pronunciation. In addition to that, um, this list didn't even count the fact that, that we know he had uh, either varioloid, which is a mild form of smallpox, or full-blown smallpox itself. Um, so with varioloid and smallpox and malaria, plus the skin disease, the total comes to 20, 20 types of ailments. Now, some of these problems, you know, there's, there's little risk of fatality from them, ADHD, for example, or crossed eyes. But a number of these other problems are potentially fatal. And basically, when you look at this list, Lincoln can't possibly have had all of them and survived to be assassinated at the age of 56. So how do we determine, determine what it's possible that he had or likely that he had? And so we have to look at the evidence. And of course, looking at the evidence for Lincoln's ailments um, is, is, you know, presents problems of its own sort. For example, you know, if you wake up tomorrow morning feeling just really lousy and you go to the doctor with a list of your symptoms and he or she runs tests, some of them may be very sophisticated and elaborate, and they may figure out your problem or they may not. And that's with you right there. So consider what kind of evidence is there of the medical ailments of a person who's been dead for over 150 years? So what kind of evidence is available still? Well, there's Lincoln's own testimony. The problem with Lincoln's testimony is that he rarely mentions his own physical problems. You know, he kept, never kept a diary, uh, occasionally in letters or um, recorded by friends. He will say something about how he's feeling or what happened. For example, uh, in 1860, he provided some autobiographical information for people who were going to write a biography for him as he was running for president. And he said that at the age of nine, he was kicked in the head by a horse when he was um, at Noah Gordon's mill in Indiana. He said he was knocked out. Well, he, he said he was apparently killed for a time, was how he phrased it. 
I think we'd call it being knocked out. And when he came to, he finished the sentence that he had been saying um, when the horse kicked him. Well, of course, doctors and historians have come up with a, a number of speculations as to how this might have, in fact, uh, affected Lincoln permanently. And some have suggested that this gave, um, that there was evidence that he had gotten um, brain damage that caused petty mal epilepsy for the rest of his life. Now, uh, there's no good evidence that I was able to find that he actually had further seizures. Um, and so that's not really very likely. Possible nerve damage, maybe, some other people have suggested, because when you look at a photo of Lincoln, um, you can see some droop to one of his eyelids. The corner of his mouth kind of curls on one side. Um, and of course, being kicked in the head may have contributed to the later headaches that we know that he had, that he mentioned himself and, and other people. Mary mentioned his headaches. His friend Orville Browning mentioned his headaches. So we know that he had them. And this may have contributed to them or not. You know, a lot of times who can say what causes a headache? Um, another thing that doctors or histor and historians have suggested that because he had, it contributed to an eye misalignment that clearly he had and occasional left eye jerking. Now you can't see the eye jerking in the photos that, that remain, but you can see a certain amount of eye misalignment. But it also seems to be a hereditary eye issue because Robert Todd Lincoln, you can see some similar misalignment of his eyes, a uh, little bit of crossed eyes and stuff. And other family members apparently also had some visual issues. So when you look at this, um, the, the thing with him being kicked by the horse, um, it's hard to say, of course, how much it affected him. Probably not epilepsy, possibly um, a little bit of nerve damage, possibly an issue with his headaches, um, probably not so much with the eye misalignment because there is evidence of it being hereditary. And Lincoln himself said nothing about further effects. Now, another thing that, that Lincoln said about uh, his health when he was uh, in his early, well, earlier years, 20s at this point, um, he had a tooth pulled in September of 1841. He wrote about this in a letter to Mary Speed, his uh, roommate Joshua Speed's sister. And he described how apparently the dentist, well, or the whoever it was who was functioning as a dentist, um, pulled out a little bit of jawbone with it. And he was in great pain and really hardly able to eat at all for a week. We also know, and he, he described it, um, that he was depressed. He had two, two major episodes of depression. The first was in 1835, and this was described by other people. But he, he described something about the, um, the depression problems that he had in December of, Jan and Janu well, December of 1840 and January of 1841 in a letter that he wrote to his um, legal partner, uh, John Todd Stewart, who was then in Washington, D.C., because he was in Congress. And Lincoln said in his letter, I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on the earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better, it appears to me. Well, it's kind of melodramatic sounding, um, but he did get better. Uh, certainly, and although Lincoln certainly had depressive episodes, and given some of the experiences that he went through as president, it's not surprising that 
when there was a serious loss in battle, for example, that he would have some depressive moments. But nothing was um, as lengthy and uncontrolled as these two early episodes in 1835 and 1840-41. Now, Lincoln was not a person who really talked about his health a whole lot. Unlike his wife, Mary, who practically wears her symptoms on her sleeve in her correspondence. Um, during his presidency, Lincoln would often stay in Washington and Mary went on vacation to New York City or to the White Mountains or to the Jersey Shore or something like that. And when she was gone, they would communicate periodically by telegram. And he would say, he was doing well, she would say, oh, she had a headache. Oh, she had a cold, da, 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 you know, whatever, one thing after another. Um, and of course, we don't actually know whether Lincoln was really doing well or whether um, he just wanted to fe make Mary feel better. Okay, so there's what Lincoln reports about his own health, which is not too much. There are newspaper accounts. Another kind of source is newspaper accounts when he's president. They tend to be things more like, the president isn't well. Uh, they talked about his case of very Lloyd. They said, you know, at times he's not well enough to see visitors, but you know, there's not a great deal of detail. Some, some when, not very much what. Third kind of evidence is doctor's reports. Now, there aren't any doctor's reports that survive as given by the doctor. They, they survive in the comments of newspapers and stuff like that. Uh, particularly when he had varioloid, there are doctor's reports in, you know, uh, about the sort that I said, you know, he's not feeling well, or he has been having thus and such a symptom. Um, varioloid is a mild form, a term for a mild form of smallpox that usually happened because either the person had been vaccinated and they got smallpox anyway, but a mild case, or um, they had had it before and they got it again, usually a mild case. And the doctors said Lincoln had varioloid. Nobody knows that he ever was vaccinated or that he um, had smallpox before. And there is also the possibility that the doctors called it varioloid because they didn't want to alarm people because he had actually a full-blown case of smallpox. And there are some doctors who have studied the newspaper reports and, and comments and things like that and suggest that he really did actually have a full-blown case. But while he was certainly ill, he does not appear to have been at, at fatal risk, although um, because many people did die from smallpox. So it was certainly a concern that the president had it. But as I said, there is no direct surviving doctor's report. Okay, so evidence, what Lincoln says, newspaper accounts, doctor's reports, generally in the newspaper. Uh, diaries and letters of presidential associates or correspondence and diaries of Springfield associates before the presidency. Um, most people who commented on Lincoln didn't say much about his health in those. But when he was president, his Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, Orville H. Browning, his Illinois friend who was in the Senate for part of uh, his presidential term, the Commissioner of Public Buildings, Benjamin B. French, and one of Lincoln's secretaries, John Hay, commented uh, a number of times on Lincoln's health. Also, Frances Seward, uh, the wife of um, Secretary of State William H. Seward, commented once in her diary, she went uh, with a couple of family members to visit Lincoln and found him um, in his office or in this, where, whatever room she found him in, this is the summer and he is his teeth are chattering and he's got this roaring fire in the fireplace and clearly he's got malaria.
So diaries of presidential associates are a fourth kind of evidence. Photographs, mainly as president, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how you could see his drooping eyes and so forth, is a, our fifth kind of evidence. The autopsy report after he was assassinated is another um, evidence. But the major problem with the autopsy is that all they did was examine his head. They were looking to see the bullet track and that sort of thing. And there are some conflicting reports about um, what exactly was where in the autopsy. So there's no other information about any other aspect of his person, except for one of the doctors noticing how muscular he was, which was also something that, um, that Gideon Wells noticed the night he was dying at the Peterson house. Now, the final kind of, of evidence uh, is recollections of Lincoln's friends and acquaintances that were collected by William H. Herndon, Lincoln's third law partner, after Lincoln's death. Um, most of these reports are many years after the fact, uh, especially pertaining to his childhood and youth, which, you know, when he, he dies at 56, his childhood and youth was a while ago. So, would you like to have something diagnosed based on these criteria? Yeah, so it's, it's really hard to do. So, why do people think Lincoln had these various illnesses? So, we'll look um, at a, a few. We're not going to look at all of them. But one of the major ones that's associated with Lincoln is the case of Marfan syndrome. Um, almost everyone has heard of, oh, Lincoln had Marfan syndrome. And in the case of Marfan syndrome, people think he has it, had it because of how he looks in his photographs. Marfan, uh, Marfan syndrome was first described in Paris in 1896 by a Dr. Marfan, for whom the syndrome is named. Now, Marfan syndrome is a disease of the connective tissue, especially arms, legs, eyes, and heart. And so the physical characteristics of a person with Marfan syndrome is that they're tall and thin. They have long, rather weak arms and legs, large hands and feet, long spidery fingers and long toes, eye problems, particularly associated with uh, dislocated lenses in the eyes, heart problems with weak, with weak valves and a weak aorta that's subject to sudden and fatal rupture. So untreated cases of Marfan syndrome often die young, although now there are much more effective treatments for it than were available at the time Lincoln lived, even if, even if he had Marfan syndrome and if anybody could know that he had Marfan syndrome. Now, Marfan syndrome is caused by a gene disorder related to protein production. And about 75% of the cases of Marfan syndrome are hereditary. A person is, who has it is always born with it, uh, even if it's diagnosed much later. And there's no specific lab test except a DNA test for the gene abnormality Otherwise, it's observation and family history. So the idea of Lincoln first having Marfan syndrome, remember that the syndrome has been diagnosed uh, initially in, um, in 1896. So the first person who suggested that Lincoln had Marfan was a Dr. Abraham Gordon, who in 1962 published an article with this suggestion because, after all, Lincoln was tall and thin, and he had long arms and legs. And so Dr. Gordon thought that Lincoln inherited the, the gene abnormality from the Hanks side, his mother's side of the family. Well, two years later, a Dr. Harold Schwartz wrote an art, in an article that Lincoln had Marfan syndrome that he inherited from his father's side, the Lincoln line. 
any evidence? Well, Schwartz had treated a boy with the syndrome who was an eighth generation descendant of Mordecai Lincoln II, who was the great great grandfather of Abraham Lincoln. Now, this is like a really long drawn out family tree because this, this boy who actually did have the syndrome is eighth generation descendant of Mordecai Lincoln from one line. Lincoln is, Abraham Lincoln is a fourth generation descendant from another line. And there are no other cases in the family. Marfan doesn't skip generations. And so, you know, it's just like, how is this possibly good evidence? You know, there's hundreds of people in this family line family who have not had Marfan. So to con to say that Lincoln has Marfan because of this kid, um, yeah, well, I don't think it's very good evidence. But a bunch of historians and doctors grab onto this and treat it as conclusive evidence, claiming Lincoln passed it on to all his sons except Robert. The media really grabbed it and ran with it. But there's a whole lot more evidence against Lincoln having Marfan that has been presented by doctors and historians. For example, you know, it talks about the long spidery fingers and toes. Well, there are life casts made of Lincoln's hands by Leonard Volk, who was a sculptor at the time. There are also tracings of his feet made for a shoemaker. And they show that Lincoln didn't have excessively long spidery fingers and toes. You know, I mean, yeah, they were long, but so was he. You know, it, it was not excessive. Okay, second, you know, Lincoln was thin, but he wasn't weak. You know, rather weak, long, rather weak arms and legs are a symptom of Marfan's. Well, as I said, he was muscular and strong. He wrestled. He chopped wood. And at his autopsy and on his deathbed, you know, it was noticed how surprised the people who noticed were to notice how muscular he was when he always looked so thin. Eye problems? Okay, Lincoln did have some eye problems. But as we've talked about, they're probably related to... Um, crossed or wandering eyes, and probably hereditary. Also, um, Marfan syndrome people are nearsighted. Lincoln was farsighted. Uh, his reading glasses still survive. And so it showed that probably we're talking about age-related um, farsightedness, not, not nearsightedness or dislocation of lenses. Um, no evidence of that whatsoever. There's also no evidence of Lincoln having cardiovascular problems. Even when he was sick in 1865, there's no evidence of that. And, of course, the idea that Marfan patients die young. Well, Lincoln was assassinated when he was 56. That may be young if you're older than 56, but, I mean, it, that is not young. Um, by regular standards. So the evidence against Marfan is considerable. It's been available since 1981, but the Lincoln Association with Marfan Syndrome still continues. John K. Latimer, who did a lot of work um, to demonstrate that Lincoln really could not have had Marfan Syndrome, said at one point that it it was a danger to real Marfan sufferers who might try to do the types of physical activities that Lincoln did, and it could bring on fatal results. I mean, they really could have uh, an aorta problem or something else caused by trying to do some of the, the wrestling or the wood chopping or, you know, any of the kind of really strenuous things that Lincoln did at times. Okay. Another question is, what about DNA testing to find out what, what Lincoln had? It was an idea that was first proposed in 1989. And of course, one thing that you have to have uh, in order to do a DNA test is a DNA sample. 
there are some fragments of bloody cloth, um, a sheet, some hair um, among the the Lincoln bodily artifacts, but they're very few. And as far as hair is concerned, for it to be useful for DNA testing, you couldn't have just clipped it off uh, down at the bottom or something to have a, a souvenir sample. It needed to be. It needs to be removed from the scalp. Uh, you know, you need the little bits of scalp that that come off with the root of the hair in order to test for DNA. The the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Chicago History Museum, Ford's Theater Museum, they have some of these fragments of bloody cloth and so forth. But most of these museums didn't want to allow testing because it destroys the sample. And with so little in the way of samples, you don't want it destroyed because it can't be, you know, we can't get any more. And you know, Lincoln is buried under tons of concrete in Springfield because of the attempts to steal his body in 1876. So, you know, his body is not going to be coming up to be examined for any potential DNA, any potential useful DNA. Okay, so it's sam potential samples are few. That's one issue. Second issue is you have to be sure you're testing uh, Lincoln's DNA, if any shows up. Because, you know, these artifacts are over 150 years old, at best. They've not been sealed in temperature constro controlled storage. They've been handled by people. What if you're testing where someone else left their own DNA because of touching it or sneezing on it or something like that? And furthermore, you can't really tell if it's Lincoln's DNA or not, because there are no Lincoln, living Lincoln descendants to compare it with. The last of them died in 1986. So you have to have a sample to test. You have to be sure you're testing Lincoln. And you have to have an effective disease uh, test for the disease you're looking for. And of course, there are a lot of diseases that people might potentially be looking for. But again, as we said with Marfan, for example, you can only test for the genetic uh, abnormality, not the actual disease. And a fourth factor is that you have to have the right kind of DNA to test because there are two kinds. Nuclear DNA um, manages the physical characteristics. Mitochondrial DNA controls the enzymes for cell energy. And once DNA is separated from the source, um, it begins to deteriorate, either when the person dies or the cells are separated from the person. Under proper temperature and humidity conditions, DNA can, can be testable for years, even centuries. But the DNA that usually survives the best is mitochondrial. And the DNA that contains information on genetic diseases is nuclear. So the chances of getting some kind of a good DNA test on Lincoln is, well, they're not great. And initially, the museums all said, no way. We're not going to destroy these little samples that we have for the likelihood that we would actually get any good kind of results. Um, but the DNA testing idea came up again in 2009. Um, a cardiologist named John G. Sotos uh, resurrected this whole idea. Now, Sotos was not mainly concerned with Marfan, but with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B, that MEN2B that I mentioned before. Now, people who have this disease have a marfanoid uh, appearance, tall, thin, but they don't have the cardiovascular or eye problems that Marfan syndrome sufferers do. People who have MEN2B tend to have an overgrowth of long bones, like in their legs, 
and an overgrowth of nerve cells forming benign lumps on lips, tongue, interior of the cheek, that kind of thing, and also in the digestive tract, causing constipation and diarrhea. Almost all people who get MEN2B also get thyroid cancer, and about half of them develop cancer of the adrenal gland, glands on the kidneys as well. So the reason Sotos comes up with this potential diagnosis is that he's looking for what caused Lincoln's health to decline so drastically in 1865, in the last few months of his life. And so Soto says that Lincoln is dying of cancer, um, probably adrenal gland cancer. So what's Soto's evidence for Lincoln having MEN2B? Well, the slightly morphinitic uh, appearance, uh, you know, tall and thin. But there's no evidence of leg bone overgrowth. Um, Sotos says, oh yeah, there are these bumps on his lips in the photos of Lincoln and several of his sons. In fact, he thinks that Eddie, Willie, and Tad also inherited MEN2B, and Tad died of thyroid cancer, which has not been suggested otherwise. Okay, so slightly morphinoid appearance, uh, alleged bumps on, on Lincoln's lips. The fact that Lincoln had constipation. Uh, Lincoln had an unusual walk. It is kind of a certain slouching and lounging aspect to it that was sort of unusual. And so Soto supposes this is because of weak muscle tone. Plus, Lincoln's head is kind of asymmetrical. So Sotos is, is a really determined researcher, and he accumulated massive amounts of information on Lincoln and his medical issues. But even when he presents important evidence that suggests, no, Lincoln did not have MEN2B, um, Sotos concludes it is anyway. He's got this one-track mind about MEN2B. So there are a number of arguments against Lincoln having had MEN2B. One, it's an extremely rare disease, and it's highly unlikely that Lincoln, his mother, who Sotos claims that Lincoln inherited it from, and three sons all had it, as Sotos argues. You know, it's, it, it seems highly unlikely. Second factor is most other people have trouble discerning lip and face bumps on, in these photos. They just are, well, potentially not there. Um, a third factor, constipation alone is not enough to indicate that he had MEN2B. Lots of people have constipation without having MEN2B. And Lincoln did have it, but uh, he treated it by taking blue pills occasionally. Now, blue pills are made up largely of mercury, and so it did have the desired effect of relieving the constipation, but if you took very many of these things, it, it led to other things, um, other symptoms that you really don't want to have. Um, but blue pills were a very common treatment for diarrhea and a number of other medical ailments at the time. Lincoln is, you know, while we know he complained about diarrhea and, or, I mean, it, it constipation and took blue pills, um, there's no indication that he had diarrhea uh, on a regular basis, unless it was part of some other, you know, flu type disease. Okay, we, we already know, as we've talked about from Gideon Wells and the autopsy, that, that Lincoln was very muscular. So, you know, he, he wasn't weak. Um, most people's heads are also asymmetrical, and Lincoln's, uh, the shape of his head matched with babies lying too much um, in, in one place, and so their head just kind of solidifies that way. Um, you know, the, the real question with Sotos and this emphasis on MEN2B is why desire that Lincoln had a rare form of cancer as a cause of his decline, 
when there are so many other logical possibilities. Lincoln surely could have had stress-related illness. Lincoln has been under incredible stress for more than four years. Um, a second factor is that Washington, D.C. is an unsanitary place. There are all kinds of germs there. Lincoln visited the hospitals frequently. He shook hands with the patients. You know he didn't have hand sanitizer. Um, you know, those two things alone could have brought him any kind of disease, and I think sometimes it did. So a much more straightforward case can be made for such an illness than for MEN2B. Now, Sotis was able to find a family with an alleged piece of actress Laura Keene's bloodstained dress. Uh, she was a leading lady at, that night at the theater. And he found in, Sotis found another collector with some Lincoln hair and a piece of bandage. And so these collectors were willing to have little fragments of their, um, their pieces tested in labs in Cleveland, Ohio, and New Zealand. And the suspense of this test uh, was filmed and aired as a National Geographic TV special in February of 2011. It, it was really agonizing to watch this actually as they're snipping the material to test. But regardless of how suspenseful they made it on the special, the labs isolated a little DNA, but it had no evidence of MEN2B. Well, Soto said, it may not have really been Lincoln's blood. The samples were contaminated or too deteriorated for accuracy, which of course sounds just like the list of problems that happen with testing DNA, uh, ancient, well, old DNA like this. So Sotis determined to keep trying because he was certain that Lincoln had MEN2B. Now, um, I, I wanna close with one more example of a way historians have misinterpreted and reinterpreted evidence about Lincoln's health. Harry E. Pratt, um, former librarian um, of the Illinois State Historical Library, now the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, in the uh, 1940s and 50s, wrote a book called The Personal Finances of Abraham Lincoln, which was published in 1943. And one of the sources he used for this was a ledger from the Springfield drugstore, Corno and Diller. This included a list of purchases made on credit by Lincoln or by the Lincoln family. Unlike contemporary prescriptions, you can't determine what was bought for whom. You know, just the, under his list, uh, the page with his list, it just is various things that he bought that were bought on credit. And on October 12th, 1860, the Lincoln household bought 50 cents worth of cocaine, C-O-C-A-I-N-E, -E, as Pratt transcribed it. Now, cocaine at that time was not a controlled substance. And in fact, it wasn't even an available substance. It was only isolated from coca leaves by a scientist in Germany that same year, in 1860 but nobody paid any attention to cocaine for another 10 years. So it's not until 1870 that people begin to notice it and use it in any way. But historians didn't know that, didn't investigate it further and assumed that someone in the Lincoln family and probably Lincoln was using cocaine at least once. Well, about 2007 or 2008, Springfield journalist and historian Tara McClellan McAndrew began to investigate further for an article because she, she was interested in this. And she found that the item, she, she checked the, the original um, ledger, and she find, found that what um, Pratt had transcribed as cocaine was actually spelled 
cocoane, C-O-C-O-A-I-N-E. So she went a little further. She looked in the newspaper. And in a newspaper ad in the Illinois State Register for the previous day, October 11th, she found an advertisement for Burnett's cocoaine, which was a hair tonic made with coconut oil. So now you can understand why Lincoln might want a hair tonic if you've seen any pictures of Lincoln. So what can we know about Lincoln's health from the evidence that's available? There have been so many speculations without really good evidence, but there is good evidence for a few things. One, he was kicked in the head by a horse with uncertain after effects. He had headaches, at least some of the migraines. He had depression, two major episodes and some more normal, shorter um, bouts of depression after major disappointments. He had malaria. He had either the milder varioloid or full-blown smallpox. He had eye issues, a hereditary misalignment, age-related farsightedness necess necessitating that he start using reading glasses when he was 45. He had constipation and took mercury pills to relieve it. One thing we know he didn't have, for sure, he didn't use cocaine. Thank you for your attention. What, he didn't use cocaine? <laughs> no, <laughs> he didn't use cocaine. <laughs> we were fortunate enough last week to have um, um, the curator of the um, Pearson Museum, who talked about the formulary that, that was uh, the Lincoln family uh, drugstore, basically, right? Um, okay. so, and he talked about the cocoaine as well. Um, and of course, we know many times Lincoln uh, complained about his own hair. So it's... It's a really logical uh, explanation for that entry in the formulary. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, Glenna, and you know the story there at the end. You know, and you know, as Barb mentioned, Mike Mosley brought that up last week, and it was a, it's a, it's a cool story I wasn't aware of until the last few weeks. Um, but uh, uh, what a mix up there, you know, with cocaine and cocaine. Um, uh, but. Uh, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put those in the comment section. Uh, maybe answer a few. Barb, you got any any questions for Glenna to kick us off? Well, um, I I did have a comment. We did have a comment early on, and uh, that in your list of diseases, uh, you you mentioned homosexuality, and someone said homosexuality is not a disease, which is absolutely true. I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to verify that we knew that and um, and I think that probably made the list because in the time of Lincoln's contemporaries it would have been listed as a disease um, not because you think it is. right right it's I I think I use diseases and syndromes in, mm -hmm. in the list mm -hmm. and it, it's something. It's something that is is part of the the chapter that this is in in the book is called um, Lincoln and the Medical Bandwagon, mm. and you know all the different things that um, people would sympathize with if if they had this situation. And there there's been a lot of debate about Lincoln and homosexuality and, and really discussing it cannot be avoided because of sure. what has um, has been presented in a lot of cases with very little evidence. And, you know, you could see some of the things that I talked about, how there's really very little evidence for what someone thinks he may have had. 
And it, with homosexuality, it is very likely the same thing. Um, but the, right. the, pe the people who talk about it are are people who 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 don't understand um, social customs in Lincoln's time. You know the thing that you know men slept together all the time, and right. there was just right. nothing to it besides they're sharing a bed because they need to. Right, and so. So no, I'm not saying it's a disease, but it is associated with the, these kinds of things. Right, right. Um, I had a question, and I don't want to take anybody else's uh, questions. Pat, have you had other ones? I am not seeing any come in. No. Uh -uh. Okay. Um, you you talked about Lincoln's declining health in the last few months of 1865. But I was under the impression that he had was he lost a lot of weight in his in, all, all through the the presidency. Is that am I am I misremembering that? No, that that's true. Okay. I, I think he started losing weight during um, during his first presidential campaign. Okay, uh, but it it was more well. It's not only the weight loss, but other things like you know he was. He was cold all the time and, um, you know, he's having headaches a lot and, you know, there are other, there are things going on. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, the, the level of death in the civil war and feeling responsible for it, I would have lost a lot of weight too, honestly. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, you know, you, why, why you would need to ascribe a, a, a disease to that i don't know <laughs> yeah you know yeah. What I mean? it just you don't really <laughs> that's enough and um and i know that, you know that the whether it's legendary or not i know he went to the war office frequently to see what the telegrams were like because he wanted to know the level of loss right and 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 so he he didn't he didn't wall himself off from the pain of that so right you know, certainly i would be depressed too i guess <laughs> but, um yeah that, that's I, and then the, i had a, one more question uh, and that was about smallpox um so i don't know that i don't think i was aware until very recently that he had smallpox or varioloid um it, was it was it wasn't that sometime right before his uh, he gave the Gettysburg address? Right, he started coming down with it really on the way to Gettysburg. Sorry, I got a plug plug in my computer, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was he was sick, getting sick at Gettysburg. He he wasn't feeling really great. He had a headache. And he had a really severe headache on the way back. And his his valet, William Johnson, was um, putting a wet, cold, wet cloth on his forehead and stuff like that and tending him all the way back. And when he got back, basically, he went to bed. And within a couple of days, he was diagnosed with varioloid. Okay. That's really interesting, isn't it? Well, <laughs> what's, what's sad is that William Johnson then caught it and he died from it. Oh. Whether he got it from Lincoln or the the thing was that that smallpox there was a smallpox epidemic going on in Washington and, and in Byron's and, and in Richmond as well at, around that time. And so yeah, I, I meant to mention that, but I guess I left that out. <laughs> well, I mean, anyone who's been to Washington, DC in the summertime knows what a freaking swamp it is. <laughs> And I mean, not that 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 uh, makes makes smallpox happen, but it certainly makes malaria happen, and it happened, and that happened, of course, in the wilds of Illinois as well. So, right. um, and because because it's a it's a lovely environment for mosquitoes. Um, so, and that that matches right up with our current exhibit, and and, uh, <laughs> and how. Uh, 
which is why we, we were very pleased to have you this time. Um, so our, our, our person who asked about homosexuality seems to have uh, appreciated that, that response. She said, very interesting. Thank you very much. So, yep, there you go. Thank you, Jermaine. <laughs> Pat, did you have any questions? Um, I, you know, you may have touched on this a little bit at the beginning, Glenna, but I'm always, you know, whenever we have these guest presenters, I'm always interested to see, you know, what, uh, what motivated people to, you know, study these particular topics or why you think they're significant. So, you know, same general questions for you, Glenna, what, what motivated you to study this particular topic? Of course, Abraham Lincoln, you know, very widely studied, one of the more widely studied people across all of history, um, uh, but this particular topic of Lincoln and medicine, you know, what made it, what motivated you to study this topic and why do you think it's, you know, overall significant? I mean, I think we can pull out some pieces from your, your presentation, but just wanted to, you know, ask you here at the end as well. Well, I, I started out when I was working on looking for a dissertation topic, I ended up with something, uh, to do with civil war medicine in the Confederacy. So that ended up as my first book. And so, Although a person who is likely to faint at the sight of blood, I ended up doing a specialist in Civil War medicine. You know, it, it's really kind of bizarre. But anyway, um, when uh, Sylvia Rodrigue, who's the uh, um, assistant, well, who's the one of the e editors for SIU Press, was putting together this. Um, Concise Lincoln Library series that SIU Press was going to publish. That they um, they were looking for someone who would address the topic of Lincoln and medicine, and it made sense to me, um, or for me to work on it because I had a a broad background in Civil War medicine, and a pretty decent background in Lincoln as well, and. Everyone is interested in Lincoln and in the, the different, every kind of facet of his career. And so that was how I ended up doing it. Well, I think he's such an, he seems like such an unlikely suspect to become president of the United States, right? Right. And, and especially in this area of Illinois, where we know he walked on our earth, you know, it just, it just seems... It seems fascinating that somebody so basically unattractive and and larger than everybody else and not, you know, just kind of disheveled, unkempt, I mean, from all accounts, right? But brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Would end up being the president. It's just and, and personable. And personable, right. He he just had a really great way of relating to people of all levels. Right. It's just, a, it's, it's, a, I think he's fascinating. I, I'm, I actually, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you, you must, there must be some, there must be some contrast for you to, to work on the papers of Andrew Johnson and then work on the papers of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I wondered if you could comment on that just a tiny little bit. <laughs> Well, I, I worked I worked on the, the Johnson papers actually much more thoroughly than the Lincoln papers mm -hmm. um, because I was with them for ten years. Okay. And the the thing that was handy was a lot of the other people um, are the same, mm -hmm. and so people who I knew about from Andrew Johnson when I then came to work on the Lincoln papers. I knew about them already. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was very handy. So there was a lot of overlap that way, but you know, there Lincoln and Johnson had really different personalities. Oh yeah. <laughs> Even though they came from similar impoverished backgrounds mm. and both had lost a parent uh, at a young age. Um, both had, were largely self-educated, but they they did different things. 
with what they knew. Yeah. So. Well, that's really great. Thank you. I appreciate appreciate hearing your, your perspective. No, and that is true that I had never thought about the parallels of their childhood and growing up, but that that's, that is there. Just came to different yeah. conclusions, didn't they? <laughs> yes. Wow. Well, do we have any more questions, questions, Pat? I am not seeing it, you know, just, you know, thank you and enjoyed the program, you know, so. Glenna, thank you so much. It was a, it was wonderful wonderful program and um, I look forward Pat to the 16th annual which you're going to be in charge of my friend <laughs> yep, we'll do these all again you know next year well I guess still this year but later on this year yeah. so so yeah thank you very much Glenn I really appreciate your time today and and sharing your uh, your your knowledge here if folks want to uh, purchase a copy of Lincoln and medicine can they just purchase that? from anywhere they may get a book? You got any recommendations on how to how to purchase one? Well, you can, of course, uh, contact the publisher directly. You can order it through your local bookstore. Um, I hate to say, I'm sure you can find it on Amazon, <laughs> um, but, you know, um, it's it's out there and around. So right. it's called Lincoln in Medicine, so. And that's from Southern Illinois University Press, correct? Right. Right. Gotcha. Great. All right. Thank you very Thanks, much, Jim. Lena. Thank you, Barb. Yeah. Have a good thank rest you. of your Sunday. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it. Everybody enjoy the rest of their day. Thank you. Yeah. Take care.